The reason a shaman chooses to have spirits is because the spirits make a Yanomamo fierce. They claim to be healers. The spirits are human-like creatures, but they carry the characteristics of the animals they represent. They are very beautiful creatures, and they speak the Yanomamo language. Children are also chosen by logs or trees or animals, talking to that person. But it's not really the animal talking. You're hearing the voice of the spirits. If you're a young man and you're going to become a shaman, the animals lose their fear of you and you become a very good hunter. As the animals talk, you become terrified, but the adults tell you, it's just a Hecula spirit, don't be afraid. I desire to have my own spirits so I could be a protector for my people. Even though they promised us all this over and over, we found ourselves living meaningless lives. We continue to suffer. Many times, as a shaman, you try to heal this child. You told the women, don't cry, I am certainly a healer. But many times the child would die, and you knew you lost when your demons started to wail. And in spite of all the spirits we had, we lived in constant fear of the spirits. As shamans, the one we fear the most is the one who lives in the heaven of heavens. We called him the enemy god. Our spirits were terrified of him. All of us shamans and all of the spirits fear the spirit who lived way up in the heaven above the heavens. You could not go there, but you might be able to see it from a long ways off. But the thing that is most amazing is that none of the spirits that we had could make it into his presence. That's why we believe that he was the enemy spirit. We believe that he was the one, this enemy spirit, up where the angels are, who was sent to eat the souls of children, and so we believe that he was the one who was responsible for the deaths of many of our children. A shaman is somebody who can work voodoo, who can work black magic. He's somebody in contact with Satan and his demons, and, and a shaman, most of them who, who are real shamans, are people who really, really have the, uh, a supernatural power from, from Satan. They'll tell you that everything that they know, everything that they do, Satan taught them. They had an awareness of spirits, probably much more better than what we do. The, than the American world. The American world tends to think that it's all just, you know, something out there, the boogeyman at night or something. These guys have no, no problem believing and understanding the spirit world. It's a deceptive power and it's a destructive power. Every shaman will tell you that his demons promised him the gift of healing, but my demons are happier when I'm trying to kill someone. Now they'll tell you, every shaman, I've had every shaman I've ever talked to will tell me that. I have, I can heal, but my, 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 he calls them his children. My children are happier when I'm trying to kill someone. Nobody dies for just any reason. You know, the snake was sent by somebody who sent the snake. You know, the fever came from somebody who sent the fever. Because you might have your, your spirits, but the guys in the next village have theirs, and you're always sending your spirits and their spirits back and forth to do voodoo-like stuff on each other. It's sort of a contradiction in itself, you know, a, a shaman becomes a shaman because he wants the gift of healing the children in his village, 
but every shaman that I know of strives for the name Ihiruwarewa, which is, in literal translation, is child eater, because they believe that they're given the power to destroy children. And, you know, they can destroy the soul of the child so the child will die. But every shaman will tell you that he's guilty of killing kids in his own village, that he can't control his power. He just blames it on somebody else. You know, he blames it on an enemy shaman. They have no friendly spirits, really. Um, their own spirits that they have living in them are friendly to them and only them, not anybody else. Um, so to talk about the supreme being that is a spirit and that loves them would blow them away. That was a village called Aratateri, and I just wanted to be in villages where no other missionary had ever gone. When we were near in the Shabra, you could hear the shamans chanting. I think there were visitors from other villages, and so when shamans get together, they usually have some big kind of chanting and doing spiritual things together, you know. And they were actually trying to heal a sick person. When we walked into the village, it was like somebody turned off a switch. Um, they just quit their witchcraft, it just the sh chanting, everything stopped. And we were surrounded instantly with guys with machetes and axes and bows and arrows and yelling and screaming like they do. And uh, we spent the night in the village. And the next morning I got up and I went over to the part of the village where the, where the old shaman, the, the guy who actually, they would have called him not only the shaman, but the boduomu, which in uh, the literal translation of a boduomu is the one who lives with us. I sat down in the hammock and I'm talking to him. And uh, we were talking about stuff, and for some reason I mentioned the word Dios. You know, like I want to tell you about Dios or something. I use a Spanish word. And uh, he got really excited. He said, I know who you're talking about. And uh, he said, you're talking about Yaiwana Napomoneo, the enemy god. Uh, he said, he's Yaiketa, the greatest of all the spirits. You know, and he, he said, there's no one else like him. He, he is... He is the, the most powerful of all. And he said he lives up in the, up in the heaven of heavens, up in the Duku Duku Misi is how he said it. And uh, he said where he lives, he said there's a crystal clear river flowing. It's called the Wararai'u. And Wararai or Wararau is what they'll use for the word for a glass, you know, a clear glass. And uh, he said, if you could just drink of that water, you would never die. You'd never get sick. He said, there's fruit trees up there that bear all the time. He said, there's just, there's fruit all the time. And those fruit, if you ate of the fruit, you, he, he not only said you wouldn't only be hungry, he said you would never, ever get sick. And he said, there's, there's, there's beings up there that are making noise all the time. He said, it's a noisy place. It's a happy place, but it's a noisy place. He said, there's no darkness, there's no sickness, there's no hunger, there's no death. And I said to him, Shoabe, how do you know that? And he said, well, my children, my demons, my Hekra, have showed me this place from a long ways off. And they showed me all that he has, the beauty of what he has. And he said, but he won't share it with the Yanomami. He hates the Yanomami. So in other words, Satan showed him the truth, but then twisted it into a lie, you know, because... We know that God does love the Yanomami, that God does want to share that with the Yanomami. And the enmity is really between God and Satan, not God and the Yanomami. And I'm sitting there taking this all in about, you know, the shaman and about, the, about God. And, you know, I'm thinking, boy, this guy's read Isaiah, you know, because it sounded like, you know, uh, some of the portions of Isaiah talking about heaven. And... And then he, he turned to me and he looked me right in the eyes and he said, and you have his, you have he said, you have his spirit living in you. 
And, it, you know, I'm 17 years old, sometimes even wondering whether I was even saved because I wasn't walking with the Lord. I knew that. When he said that to me, you know, when he said, and you have his spirit within you, I said to him, I said, Schwabe, how do you know that? And he said, well, yesterday when you came in, because of God's spirit being in you, because Yaiwana Namore is there, the enemy God is there, all of our heck what I left, they're outside the village wanting to know when you're going to leave so they can come back. It, it was probably the most humbling experience in my life because I remember I just, um, on the way back to the boat, it was like a two-day hike back to the boat, and I just wept most of the way, you know, and just realizing that God had really sealed me with His Holy Spirit, that God's Holy Spirit living within me didn't hinge on me, it didn't mean whether I was obedient, whether I was walking with the Lord the way I should. It didn't mean uh, God didn't, didn't limit, limit what he was going to do in my life to me being the Christian that I was supposed to be. That he had, he had sealed me with his Holy Spirit. He had put his Holy Spirit within me. And it didn't depend on me. It depended on him.